the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace has once again uh, brought together a, a first class a panel of uh, experts uh, on a topic which has uh, always been at the top of the international agenda um, and never more so at the present time. So first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, all for, for coming. Uh, and uh, introduce myself. My name is Jamie Shea from NATO, uh, and I have uh, the privilege of uh, having been invited by Fabrice to be the moderator uh, for this evening. A moderator, of course, means not only introducing the speakers, but doing my best to provoke a good Q&A uh, debate session uh, afterwards with our three uh, experts. Um, uh, the privilege of the moderator is also to be able to make some introductory remarks. Uh, I've never passed up this opportunity, uh, and I won't do so tonight uh, 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 either. Um, but I'll be brief. Uh, a couple of days ago, when I was sort of doing a little bit of reading to at least be able to ask the right questions this evening, um, I came across a quotation from, guess who, Winston Churchill. Uh, his bust may no longer be in the White House Oval Office, but his spirit lives on. And um, I came across a speech that he gave to the House of Commons in November 1936, where he said, I quote, don't, I can't do the accent, Churchill was not a Cockney uh, Englishman, uh, uh, unfortunately. Uh, he said, the error of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedients, of delays, is coming to a close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. I like that, a period of consequences. Um, and I imagine that uh, all of you, experts or not, in the area of proliferation, looking at where we are today, probably also believe that we are entering a period, period of consequences. We seem to be at a crossroads uh, where within the next couple of years, we either go to a world characterized by more and more nuclear weapons states and more and more uh, uh, proliferation, horizontal as well as vertical, or a, a world which finally, uh, painfully, slowly uh, starts to work towards the increasing delegitimization of nuclear weapons as, a, as an instrument of security, makes it harder for new nuclear powers to uh, come into existence, and which goes towards uh, President Obama's vision uh, of a global zero or a world uh, without nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we want to uh, tease out of, of tonight's debate uh, is whether, uh, which, or at least which vision is the more realistic one. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what is likely to uh, happen in the years ahead. Um, I think that also we're aware that we're in a period where the move towards uh, more and more nuclear disarmament, more and more control of, of proliferation, more and more international standards and rules. Uh, that golden age of the 1990s, if you like, uh, is, is coming to an end. Uh, if Just to recall, uh, the 90s were a period where the MPT picked up more and more members. I think it's 189 today, became a, virtually a universal treaty um, in the wake of the uh, Iraq uh, the first Iraq war and discovering the weaknesses of the IAEA, uh, the additional protocol was invented, the IAEA was given uh, additional uh, means. Uh, we had new treaties, chemical weapons, uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, if, even if not ratified by the United States. We had, uh, in the wake of the Gorbachev era, uh, arms control agreements ongoing between uh, the US and, and Russia. We had many countries, uh, France, for example, with the missiles on the Plateau d'Albion, the, uh, the, the nuclear submarines, the US, uh, uh, even Russia, making unilateral uh, steps to forego certain capabilities. And, uh, and we had some success in sort of freezing the nuclear aspirations of many countries, Libya more recently, but South Africa, uh, Iraq, although Iraq, of course, uh, in the wake of the, uh, the UN inspectors after the uh, conflict, uh, even for a while North Korea, uh, before it quit the NPT Treaty in 2003. But, but since the end of the 90s, I think there is a general public impression, uh, messieurs les experts, uh, rightly or wrongly, that things are, are not going so well. Uh, you know, the NPT review conferences have become increasingly embittered with the division between the nuclear haves and the nuclear have-nots. I mentioned the North Korean case of actually leaving uh, the uh, treaty. Uh, we've had uh, Iran, Syria, obviously your comment on this, uh, uh, maybe not violating the uh, 
uh, MPT treaty per se, but at least being economical with the truth when it comes to transparency and allowing the inspections to take place. We've had the India-Pakistan uh, nuclear programs, uh, and of course, uh, uh, and I think Mark uh, uh, Hibbs is going to comment on this, the, the problem that uh, Mohammed El Baradai famously described as the nuclear Walmart, the AQ Khan network with the possibility that nuclear weapons would no longer be the monopoly of constituted states, but could fall into the hands of uh, terrorist organizations. Um, uh, would that lower the threshold uh, for their use? So I think the question that we want to try to get at it, it, this evening is, you know, it, what can we do uh, about all of this? Um, uh, should we pessimistic, be pessimistic that the regimes that we've tried to build up over the last half century are, are unraveling? Can the MPT review conference mark a time when uh, we can begin to uh, reverse that process and put in a stronger rules-based uh, uh, system. Um, I think what is interesting is that there are now some straws in the wind uh, which suggest uh, that the empire is fighting back, or if you like, the international community is now seriously gripping this issue uh, and trying very hard to think a way ahead. I mean, for example, we have these uh, hard-headed strategists who, as far as I know, were never in the campaign for nuclear disarmament uh, in their misspent youth, like Henry Kissinger or George Schultz or Sam Nunn, actually saying that, you know, what used to be idealistic, uh, in other words, uh, uh, a world without nuclear weapons is in fact now a realistic strategy uh, uh, and should be uh, followed. Uh, we have the Obama vision, we have the US and Russia with the START agreement, the, st the follow on to START, uh, resuming uh, uh, reductions. We have the nuclear posture review of the United States, which suggests that the U.S. Mm -hmm. is leading the way towards not giving up its weapons yet, but at least limiting the circumstances in which they might be used, uh, particularly to focus on other states with nuclear weapons. Uh, and although it's a little bit wobbly, uh, we at least seem to be holding the international consensus among the major powers in dealing with Iran uh, and moving towards uh, uh, sanctions. So the question I think I'd like the panel to consider as uh, they uh, uh, make their remarks and, uh, and then engage the discussion is, um, is this enough? Do we need to do more? What can uh, we do uh, more uh, over the next uh, a uh, few months. Uh, in other words, uh, how do we balance, if you like, uh, uh, on the one hand, and I think this is simple, a very much a dilemma for the NATO countries, on the one hand, the sort of belief that, well, there are going to be nuclear weapons in the world for a long time to come, and therefore, uh, you know, always hang on to nurse for fear of getting something worse. Let's hang on to ours. But balanced against that, the need to show leadership uh, in the disarmament and non-proliferation field. And I think the second problem we face, the second dilemma in the alliance at the moment, is on the one hand, uh, we want to continue efforts of prevention, but rather as the same with climate change, we also need to think about mitigation. You know, what if the prevention doesn't work? Then what sort of mitigation uh, should we start looking at, uh, missile defence in particular? This is a very difficult vast debate. I imagine it's difficult even for experts. And uh, I th what we're going to do tonight is have three separate presentations by three distinguished members of the Carnegie Nuclear Policy Program. Uh, we'll first uh, listen to Pierre Goldschmidt, uh, who will address, I think, uh, these issues through the prism of, of uh, uh, Iran. Uh, Pierre uh, is, is uh, well known here because he has the nationality of this country. Uh, he's now a senior associate at Carnegie. But all of you will know him as a former deputy director of the IAEA, where he was responsible for safeguards. Then I will turn to Sharam Chubin, who is also a senior associate in the same program at Carnegie, uh, and an expert not only on proliferation but terrorism and the Middle East. We've heard you before on many occasions, uh, particularly on the Middle East. Uh, you're associated uh, with the Department of Defense, RAN Corporation, uh, uh, and the United Nations, or have been in the past, so you have vast experience. You will also, I think, address the issue uh, of Iran and the MPT, uh, and then we'll change the optic slightly by turning to Mark Hibbs, also senior associate. I don't know, Fabrice, if you have any junior associates, but you have good senior associates, uh, where uh, you uh, have been looking very much at nuclear safety and security issues in the wake, of, particularly, of the summit in Washington. Uh, and with a focus on Asia, and I'm told more recently Turkey, which is an yes. interesting case. So those are the three panellists. I'll ask each to go for 10 minutes. 
that will give you bags of time to think of difficult questions to ask them, uh, and then we'll go with the Q&As and the discussion until uh, around 6.30. So, Pierre, lead us off, please. I was asked to share with you some thoughts uh, which have not been uh, generally discussed yet uh, about Iran and the future. And um, since uh, this, these talks are being recorded, that English is not my mother language, I don't speak as well as Jamie, uh, I will read my prepared notes, and so I'm sure that it won't take more than 10 minutes. The adage, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, rings true in most cases. This precautionary principle constitutes, in particular, the very basis of nuclear safety. Unfortunately, it has not been given sufficient weight when it comes to protecting against the risk of nuclear proliferation. The case of Iran is particularly relevant. Effective deterrence requires convincing others that the cost of them, to them, of taking an action one wishes to prevent is far greater than any benefit. However, once such an action has been committed, such as North Korea testing a nuclear device, reversing the situation is much more difficult, if at all possible, than preventing it in the first place. This is why it has often been recommended, including most recently by the International Commission on Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, the ICNND, co-chaired by Gareth Evans, to accept the idea that Iran should be allowed to continue enriching uranium below 5% under strict and intrusive IEA safeguards. <clears throat> A major difficulty with this proposal is that the international community cannot simply ignore the repeated calls by the IEA Board of Governors and legally binding UN Security Council resolutions requiring Iran to suspend all enrichment related and other sensitive uh, nuclear activities. The main objective of these Security Council resolutions is to obtain Iran's full cooperation with the IEA in order to enable the agency without further delay to provide to the international community an assurance that all nuclear material and activities in Iran are exclusively for peaceful purposes. However, to reach such a conclusion, in light of Iran's past deception and concealment efforts over many years, Iran would have to fully implement measures along the lines of the temporary complementary protocol that I have previously proposed and which goes beyond the provision of the additional protocol. To move along the line recommended by the ICNND, the Security Council would have to decide that for as long as the IA Director General can report that Iran is full, fully and without interruption implementing that temporary complementary protocol, the continued production of enriched uranium up to 5% would not per se be a cause for new, new sanctions. This would represent a major concession to Iran, which would be acknowledged as such by China and the non-aligned states. It is, however, likely that a number of Western states will raise objections of principle to such a compromise, and I expect that we will see more of the same. But let's face it. When dealing with Iran's nuclear program, the international community has always been one step behind. Over the last few years, Iran's parliament and leadership have on a number of occasions threatened that Iran could withdraw from the NPT. Most recently, in February this year, Iran stepped over the implicit red line of it enriching uranium beyond 5%. It is easy to guess what the next provocative move could be, Pro producing high enriched uranium by enriching to a level exceeding 20% U-235, for example, to 63% uranium-235 under the pretext of fabricating irradiation targets for a more efficient production of technetium-99 used for medical radio diagnostic. Iran is very creative. 
In other ways as well, Iran may be coming closer to crossing a red line signaling efforts to acquire a nuclear weapons capability. The February 18, 2010 IE report on Iran, I quote, raises concern about the possible existence in Iran of past or current undisclosed activities related to the development of a nuclear payload for a missile, end quote. To prevent the Iranian nuclear crisis from escalating, it would be advisable to clearly define the red lines and the consequences of crossing them. The best way would be for the Security Council to adopt a resolution under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter deciding that if Iran were to produce high-enriched uranium, to separate plutonium, or to notify its withdrawal from the NPT before the IE is able to draw the necessary conclusion about the exclusively peaceful nature of its nuclear program, then a number of strong and well-defined sanctions would automatically be applicable and implemented without requiring a further UN Security Council resolution. This should also be the case if Iran is found to proceed with nuclear weaponization activities or were to divert nuclear material. The merit of such an approach would be to make Iran responsible for any negative consequences of its decisions, knowing in advance that it cannot count on any UN Security Council permanent members' right to veto. It could help any part of the Iranian leadership or civil society that is not determined to reach a nuclear weapons capability at all costs to make a more compelling case to follow another course. No country, including Russia, China, and Turkey, has an interest in Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. All should therefore be willing to support a preventive resolution entirely contingent on Iran's future actions. It would also set a valuable precedent to discourage any other states which may otherwise be tempted to follow suit. To be sure, there is no precedent of a UN Security Council adopting a resolution requiring automatic sanctions if a state undertakes certain actions. This makes it hard to do so in this case, but it is not a valid reason for not trying. There always need to be a first case to establish a precedent, and the purpose for establishing the case this time is certainly justifiable. Iran has been ignoring for more than three years legally binding Security Council resolutions and refusing to comply with the IEA resolution for more than six years. Its recent actions have increased the threat to international peace and security, ensuring that the economic cost to Iran will be severe, swift, and certain if it crosses the red line signaling, signaling weapons intention is a far better course for the international community than the option of a military action or acquiescence in weapons production. On the other hand, if against all expectations, Iran adopts a cooperative attitude that has been requested by the IA and required by the Security Council for so many years, Security Council members and others have promised a wide range of benefits, including the normalization of diplomatic relations, the provision of nuclear power technology and other technical assistance, and the abolition of trade and investment barriers. Thus far, Iran has unfortunately shown little interest in converting the P5, five nuclear weapons plus one offer uh, that was made and annexed to a UN Security Council resolution into a binding long-term multilateral agreement. George Bernard Shaw has stated that, I quote, the only thing we learn from experience is that we don't learn from experience. The way a disunit this united P5 plus 1 has been managing the North Korean and Iranian nuclear files seems to prove him correct. The international community should not wait passively for Iran to carry out previous threats to produce high enriched uranium and even to withdraw from the NPT. A legitimate and verifiable preventive Security Council resolution as proposed 
while representing a major concession to Iran, should be more effective and easier, easier to adopt than any post facto curative measure. Thank you. I think Iran may well be a lost cause. And I think we may have to start preparing to live with it, uh, with a nuclear-capable Iran. That's not to su suggest by any means that I am comfortable with that notion or that I'm advocating that we acquiesce in it. I think we should continue with strategies to prevent it. But I honestly think that after eight years, uh, several Security Council resolutions, three or four, two sets of packages from the P5 plus one, and innumerable initiatives from countries like Russia, we've gotten absolutely nowhere. And there are four reasons, or four sets of reasons, why I think we failed. One is, well, there are four sets of reasons that I would put forward. One is Iran is now more determined than ever. Two, the failure of the international community that goes along with what Pierre was mentioning. Three, I would say there are inherent difficulties given the Iraqi precedent. And I think that's very important if you look at the Iraqi precedent. And four, there's certain ambiguity or difficulty about what the, the West is trying to do. Now, let me go through it briefly. Iran is more determined. Since June of last year, the regime has marginalized the moderates, become more monolithic, has also become more brittle and vulnerable. But it's also more determined. And I think it's more determined because it has less to fall back on in terms of legitimation. They can't really say they represent the people. People are out on the streets, or lots of them are. Um, so the, the, the nuclear issue is a domestic legitimation element. And it always was, but it's become more important. Secondly, the failure of the international community. The Security Council has failed to enforce violations of the NPT or its safeguards. Um, a major reason for that is that Russia and China have been playing games, I think, and basically preferring the strategic leverage of an anti-Western Iran to non-proliferation. And I think their real aim is to tie the United States down on this issue. And they've, they've had considerable success. And now they're being imitated to some extent by countries like uh, Turkey and Brazil who are posturing as, as uh, being brokers or bridges, but in fact, I think, uh, doing much more than that. They're, they're, they're demonstrating their own importance, their impartiality, and their independence. And I think there's a certain amount of mileage in both countries in, in defying the Yankees. Um, the Yankee, I should say. But international reactions are very difficult. I mean, China says, let's give diplomacy more time. Russia says, let's avoid the energy sector and let's not hurt the Iranian people. Not mentioning Israel's nuclear weapons annoys Mr. Amr Musa. Threatening consequences annoys Mr. Baraday. Not threatening consequences annoys the French. Emphasizing missile defense upsets the Russians, and I dare say the Chinese. Not emphasizing missile defense ups upsets new Europe. Consulting Russia and China dilutes the results, yet without United Nations Security Council resolutions, it's difficult to convince the Germans. And planning for a possible nuclear Iran can be seen by some as accepting a nuclear Iran. And seeking to engage Iran in, in a, is seen by some self-proclaimed Republican realists as wasting time, as if they have an alternative. And seeking to de-emphasize nuclear weapons in the US can, is and has been seen by some people in the US as weakening US defenses, while seeking a grand bargain with Iran upsets Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Russia. So the international community is not terribly united on these issues or how to get there. Uh, the inherent difficulties are two. One is Iraq. If you go back and, or if you remember, cast your mind back to the Iraqi thing, this has made it very difficult to get public support, I think, for, for Iran, even though Iran is clearly a different case. Uh, the intelligence manipulation or the intelligence failure about WMD, the exaggeration of uh, th uh, the emphasis on the evilness of Saddam Hussein, the blurred goals, whether disarmament or regime change was the game, um, the emphasis on how unpopular the regime was and being accepted as liberators, even the experience of sanctions, which Saddam Hussein managed to make painful for the population without being painful for himself, is carried over to a certain reluctance in public opinion, anyhow, to envisage sanctions that might hurt. 
the people of Iran, but as if it's the same thing. And particularly the focus on Bush used to say that, that Saddam Hussein acted as if he had something to hide. Well, he did have something to hide. He was hiding the fact that he didn't have anything, as, as the Dolpha report showed. And, and the Iranians are exactly the same case. I mean, the Iranians act as if they've got something to hide. Well, do they have something to hide? Well, we, this is where inspections are useless, because the more inspections we had in Iraq, the less certain we were that we knew everything. In other words, inspections will not satisfy you if it's a big country, you can have the most intrusive inspections you want, but if you don't trust the leadership, no amount of inspections will reassure you. That was clear in the Iraqi case, at least for, for the Anglo-Saxons, that they didn't trust inspections as being an answer. And I think in the case of Iran, much the same. So it's very hard to imagine, uh, to, 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 to craft a policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran in the with the legacy of Iraq behind us. I think it's very hard to get people to, to see this as different. Then there's the ambiguity. What, what ambiguity is that? Well, what exactly does, uh, there are two things really. What would constitute a smoking gun if Iran wants to get up to the threshold of a nuclear capability and not beyond it? At what point do you have definitive proof to mobilize the Security Council? What, what does it have to do? It's not testing. Uh, it's weaponizing somewhere in some lab over there. Uh, as far as you can see, the fissile material is still below what's required for a nuclear. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to see what, what you do. For, for what would constitute a clear case of a smoking gun? The second is, as Fred Ickley said years ago, after detection what? Which is, okay, you've detected uh, a uh, contravention on the other side. This was in the east-west context. What do you do? They're breaking the treaty. What do you do? Do you attack them? You dump the treaty? Well, let's assume we could agree on the smoking gun. Would China and, and Russia, first they won't agree on what the smoking gun is. They keep letting these red lines go, as Pierre said. And secondly, would they agree on what to do about it? Because right now they're saying let's have another 10 years of negotiation. So this the inherent difficulty is that the, the, the US government has moved from a nuclear weapons Iran is unacceptable to a nuclear weapons capable Iran is unacceptable. Uh, it's perfectly understandable, I and mean, you read the Gates Memorandum where he says basically that what do we do if they get so close to the threshold that they can break out overnight? So there's an inherent problem here as to what, what constitutes total unacceptability and then what do you do about it? Um, let me just conclude. I have a, couple of minutes. I think there are a lot of steps. Basically, policy, sanctions, uh, inducements, the threat of force on the table, uh, possible grand bargains down the road or possible new packages. All of these are intended to buy time. To buy time for the Iranians to change their mind. Not to reverse their program. I don't think anyone expects that they're going to... They might stop the program, but they're still not going to reverse it. Uh, their cost calculus has to change. Now, it seems to me unlikely that this regime is going to change its cost calculus in the next four or five years. Now, I haven't listed all sorts of arguments why my argument may be wrong. I left that for, for discussion, you know, what, what could change things. But it seems to me that, that uh, assuming that they are going this way and that you cannot do much about it, but you should try, what sorts of measures should you take to reduce the consequences without, as I say, accepting? Well, we've seen it, and the, the U.S. government is trying to do it. I mean, first it's, it's uh, done the unilateral things, like uh, try to de-emphasize the utility of nuclear weapons, reduce its, its arsenal, and so on and so forth. Um, Maybe it hasn't gone far enough. It's got a long way to go. It's not even sure that the, the Congress will go along with some of these. CTBT, for example, hasn't, hasn't been signed, uh, uh, and so on. Um, but clearly, there are things that should be done on the Article 6 track and on the unilateral track to de-emphasize nuclear weapons. Secondly, it seems to me that you should not exaggerate the value and importance of nuclear weapons or the consequences of Iran getting nuclear weapons. The reason is very clear that if you do exaggerate them, it will convince the Iranians they've got something. 
whereas doing what the U.S. is doing, which is trying to extend security guarantees and deterrence and defense, increasing the defense capabilities of allies in the region to dilute the consequences, is important. I think it's very important not to draw red lines that are about, that are about as lasting as lines drawn in the sand. Because in the last eight years, the West has been drawing red lines and retreating from them so rapidly that it makes your head swim. Uh, from the notion that Iran was, was not entitled to have any nuclear technology, including a reactor, to now the notion that uh, Pierre is talking about, which is that, yes, maybe some enrichment is acceptable. What I'm saying is, let's not draw any more red lines we're going to walk away from. Better just drop the red lines. Uh, because, the, because the credibility of deterrence later on, it will be diminished by this behavior. And I think that's very important. The sorts of things you're doing now will affect how much of a deterrent you can provide to Iran. If you say, if you, if you support Hezbollah, you know, we'll get really angry. Well, you know, you've been rolling over every time we do something, so why should we believe you on that? So make sure that, the, that these, these red lines are not drawn. I think you shouldn't encourage Israel's exaggeration of the consequences. I'm not saying Israel is paranoid. I think Israel has every right to feel insecure about a regime that, that acts and speaks this way and, and acts the way it does in the region. But I think that indulging Israel in its fear that, that a nuclear Iran is somehow a threat, an existential threat to Israel, is, is sheer nonsense. Most Israelis know it as well. It's, it's a threat to their security, certainly through Hamas and Hezbollah, but it's not an existential threat and won't be by a long, long chalk, quite apart from what the Iranians intend, which I don't think they intend to mess with the Israelis at all. That's a diversion. Israel is a wonderful argument for selling this thing to the Arab street. It has absolutely nothing to do with Iran's strategic uh, motivations. So uh, don't threaten nuclear weapons, of course. Uh, finally, the last point, which is, you know, people talked about containment and deterrence. Of course, it's not that easy. Uh, it wasn't that easy under the Soviets, with the Soviets. There were mistakes. Uh, near misses. But I think the parallel is this, that what finally changed was an evolution in the Soviet Union and, of course, in Eastern Europe. The, the society changed. You had, a president, a, you had a general secretary who came along who realized things had changed and basically made the decision peacefully to change, though he didn't realize he was going to lose control. I think what you're going to have, the best hope in Iran is, is for change. It, it won't come suddenly, it won't come next week, but uh, minimizing the impact of whatever it is they get, uh, holding out the possibility of better treatment if they change their behavior and their, and their program, uh, and waiting for, for time. I mean, that, that's the parallel. I think the Soviet parallel is basically you, you have to make sure they can't get any strategic benefits from going down this road, but you don't have to, to threaten them to make them accelerate their program to increase the number of bombs or take hostages in the region. Uh, but you simply show that you're, this is a long-term proposition. Iran isn't going to go away uh, as a strategic problem, and it needs uh, long-term sustained thinking. Thank you. Uh, we go to the final speaker, uh, Mark Ibs, uh, who is going to take a slightly different tack on nuclear security and safety issues. Mark. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, I'm just going to take a little bit broader uh, approach to this issue, um, pointing out that the intellectual debate um, on Iran uh, has been going on and is, is in the background of the discussion that we've had now from our co-panelists here, um, has led to a focus by Iran but also by the non-aligned movement um, at the IEA on Article 4 rights to nuclear uh, cooperation, trade and development. and. We will see uh, the acid test of the debate on Iran uh, will come to a head at the NPT REVCOM uh, beginning next week through the end of May. And many people that we've talked to are expecting a very uh, strong relationship between Iran, which has claimed throughout that its rights to uranium enrichment are guaranteed under Article 4 of the NPT. This has been joined by NAM members and other developing country states in the NPT supporting Iran in deflecting pressure uh, 
to have sanctions, and there is a chorus of disgruntled NAM and uh, developing country states who will be attending the, the meeting in May, and they are not only going to make it difficult for the P5 and the Western group to pursue uh, indirectly the Iranian issue in the review conference, but they are also going to have a profound effect on other issues which are being framed through the, the mirror of, of Article 4. Um, one of these is the issue of nuclear security, which we've seen already come up at the nuclear security summit this month and will also come up again at the NPT meeting. Um, it should be pointed out that because the NAM and developing countries more generally strongly objected to uh, efforts by the Obama administration and others to uh, get an agreement on summiteers at the NSS on binding commitments, um, because they so strongly and successfully objected to this, um, we are going to see, in effect, uh, very little attention at all to the issue of nuclear security at the NPT uh, Revcon. There were, I think, a few people who believed uh, that because the NSS meeting was held, that would somehow give a shot in the arm to the issue of new sec nuclear security at the Revcon. That's not going to happen, again, in large part because of what happened in the interaction between the Obama administration and the non-aligned uh, group and moving toward that summit. Basically, uh, what the security summit did was establish once and for all that there are very, very strong limits on how much traction the nuclear security agenda is going to get uh, in the uh, scope of the NPT. Um, to uh, point out that this is a significant development, it, we go back to what happened during the prep comms for the RevCon uh, beginning in 2007. There was a great deal of very constructive uh, proposals being put forward by the EU, particularly in the area of nuclear security. They followed these up in endorsing important conven conventions, including the Security Council Revolution, Resolution 1540. They endorsed an amended, amended Physical Protection Convention. Um, there were other endorsements. The EU states supported, and this is very important, they supported a comprehensive and mutually reinforcing, reinforcing approach to nuclear security, which would move forward to create a, a real regime where you would have uh, institutions, you would have cross connections of all of these individual efforts. And then finally in 2009, um, Prime Minister Brown uh, announced that he wanted to see nuclear security set up as the fourth pillar of the NPT. This was reiterated by uh, Secretary Clinton also in 2009, and it looked as if this initiative was going to gain some support in the, in the U.S., but as I said, because the, the NAM group so, so strongly uh, reacted against uh, more commitments and more uh, responsibilities in this area uh, through the NPT, that the fourth pillar idea was in fact abandoned by the United States before the summit meeting was convened, and it has basically been dropped. So the advocates of nuclear security coming out of this meeting are on the defensive. Um, we've seen them getting support uh, by important uh, states uh, outside of the NPT. India, Pakistan share these concerns. The NAM group basically sees nuclear security as a ploy by the United States to inhibit their peaceful nuclear activities, again, uh, uh, referring to Article 4. Um, so the, Security Summit raised awareness on a certain level, uh, but what we had was intense political opposition to the parties, to any binding commitments. Uh, some countries agreed to a potpourri of individual national undertakings, um, but uh, b basically at the REVCOM, this issue is going to disappear. I think the most optimistic outcome 
coming on after the NSS is simply that there will be, at best, uh, an endorsement of uh, 1540. There will be an, an endorsement of an amended Physical Protection Convention, maybe also for the International Convention on Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, but that's about as far as it will go. Um, in, in my view, the polarization of this issue by the NAM coming out of the debate over safeguards verification in Iran has meant that an opportunity was lost by the advocates of nuclear security, including the West, the EU, the US, and the rest, to explain and demonstrate to the non-aligned movement and other developing countries that a stronger nuclear security regime is in their national interest. You recall that the NAM states, in many cases, complain that more safeguards, more verification, more attention to nonproliferation and nuclear weapons has nothing to do with the developing countries. It's really a matter for advanced nuclear states and the threats they pose to each other. But in fact, the absence of strong, robust nuclear security um, practices in developing countries and NAM countries has left us with a track record of source accidents, of accidents where developing countries experienced fatal uh, accidents where, you know, their, their people died because radiological material was not well confined, it wasn't secured. Uh, many of these countries want to have nuclear power programs in the future, and these accidents, these source accidents, I can give you a few examples of these, they, they, they led to a deterioration and to a spread of fear in the populations in these countries, which is going to make it more difficult for these non-aligned and developing countries in the future to develop nuclear power uh, program from the ground up. So th this rhetorical debate has poisoned the well and has made it very, very difficult uh, for the nuclear security agenda to move ahead. That being said, in a bigger uh, sense, what we're going to see at the NPT is that security issues are not going to be in the forefront in part because they don't have an inter international uh, institutional frame of reference. They're not connected to the NPT directly. There's no binding treaty. The IAEA has a very limited role in this uh, field. They have no implementation role. Um, and we see a lack of support and enthusiasm by many of the NPT states on these issues because they've got nowhere to go to address them. So what we found is, is that at the working level between the EU, the United States, the IEA, and others who are talking and interacting with the NAM countries on nuclear security issues, at the working level, there's a lot going on. There's transfers of technology, there's assistance, there's technical programs at the IEA in the United States, the EU are contributing to this. But at the decision-making level, at the political level in these countries, that message isn't getting through. There's a disconnect between the real work that's going on in the developing countries, assisted by the EU, the United States, and others, and the rhetoric which is going on at the top, poisoned by this debate over safeguards in Iran, which is preventing the nuclear safety issue, or nuclear security uh, agenda from moving ahead. So uh, in the long run, what do we see here? We've just experienced uh, an exercise where the IEA convened a group of experts and advisors to look at the future of the IEA. These people in the last several years have proposed a massive increase in resources, including financial resources, to the IEA. Again, the NAM and the developing countries rejected this out of hand. They did not support it. And so we're looking at a situation that we are now facing in the 21st century perhaps a different suite uh, of threats uh, which we didn't face before which are going to have to be addressed. And in the past, we began a situation in the 1960s and 70s when the IEA instituted a system of safeguards based on uh, accountancy and trust. We went through a period uh, sparked off by the first Iraq war 
when, after we learned that Iraq had a massive crash program outside of safeguards to develop nuclear weapons, that triggered a response at the IEA to shift their focus on nuclear threats away from routine accounting of nuclear materials that are declared and toward programs that are undeclared. We've moved into this phase where now this is ongoing, and we're seeing uh, countries participating in this now pressing the IEA harder to shift even further their resource allocation away from um, safeguards and routine surveillance and accounting and toward these undeclared activities and clandestine activities. They are now saying we don't have any money, we don't have any more resources to do all of this together, so we want to see resources be shifted away from this the EU and Euratom uh, here in the EU is playing a, a very major role in pressing the IE to do this. And now we may be moving into a third phase where the nuclear security uh, advocates are saying, we now, if we're going to have less money to spend, we should shift even further some of these resources toward uh, addressing threats in the 21st century that we have not seen before. So. The IEA has made the effort to make findings of countries as being uh, in compliance, generating greater confidence that, that declared nuclear programs in these countries are peaceful, and the advocates of nuclear security are now, are now suggesting that these resources should be even more radically shifted away from these programs and more toward the 21st threat coming from terrorists and other non-state actors. So we've had three very substantive inputs, uh, and uh, what we will do now, of course, is give you an opportunity to speak. There's no. Oh, there is a microphone. Good. So, thanks. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Gauri Kandekar. Um, I was a student at the College of Europe, and now I'm working at the European Parliament. I'm from India, and my question is that, well. Pakistan as a country went through a lot of turmoil during the period when President Musharraf left and there was no credible government. Internal security was very poor. And then it continues to find itself in one of the most volatile regions, geopolitical regions in the world. And the Taliban came very close, in very close proximity to Islamabad recently, as we had seen. Why didn't uh, Pakistan figure on top of the nuclear uh, international nuclear security agenda more than Iran because um, arguably we can say that Pakistan does pose an immediate threat to international security. Okay, thanks. Good to see you again. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot for that. Who's next? My question is um, more geared towards Sharam or yeah, Pierre, but uh, whoever can take it. Um, whether they're pro-regime or uh, opposition, we've seen that uh, the population generally has had widespread support um, for Iran's nuclear program. Uh, and if we take this program as a matter of national pride, whether the Mossadegh effect or um, respect or because of a development uh, issue, have inducements and sanctions uh, in these elements been a waste of time from the beginning um, or not? Okay, thanks a lot for that. Fabrice, you wanted to come in too, please. Fabrice Potier from the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, I had a question for probably Sharam and, and Pierre uh, about nuclear Iran. To what extent the nuclear Iran, Iran might uh, change the strategic calculus of the regional powers? I'm thinking particularly of uh, Egypt, uh, Turkey, and, and also to an extent uh, Saudi Arabia. And, and uh, that is more for, for Pierre. Uh, to what extent will a, a nuclear test-free uh, agreement or ban uh, in, in, in the Middle East be a game-changer for the, the current situation? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. So, uh, Sharam, I think uh, many of the questions were in your direction first, and so you, then Pierre, and then Mark, and then we'll have another round. Please. Well, I won't mention um, the Pakistan case. I'd, I'd, leave, I'd leave that to, to perhaps to Mark. Um, Iran's nuclear program has the support of the vast majority of Iranians in the sense that they support Iran's right 
to nuclear technology. There are great divisions within Iran about confronting the international community, not engaging them, and blatantly provoking them. And there's absolutely no discussion within Iran about whether Iran has right to get nuclear weapons or to go toward nuclear weapons. So I want to be very clear on that. Uh, this is a, a mistaken notion that the Iranian government, this particularly the Ahmadinejad government, has tried to push to people. I, if you look at the last article I wrote, in about a page I describe all sorts of things they've done, the government, that suggests they don't think they have popular support for it. They've never debated it. They've never talked about the costs. They've never, uh, uh, they have forbidden uh, the press from mentioning any of the, the criticisms coming from abroad. They've portrayed it as a question, a clear case of technology denial to keep the Islamic Republic backward. In those terms, everybody agrees that nobody should do that, okay? So th that's not a problem. But, but the issue really is, not, it goes beyond that. The issue is what sort of program, at what cost, uh, how, how to deal with international concerns, should you try and give them more access to why destroy certain sites, for example, when they when they're come under suspicion from this inspector and so on. So the premise, I think, is has to be qualified. The second point is, of course, that of course, uh, Western policy has played into the Iranian regime's hands. And I alluded to that. And under the Clinton administration, the policy was Iran has no right to any nuclear technology, full stop. Well, the Iranians said, look, we're, we signed the end. This was before Natanz, before they were n in non-compliance with their safeguards agreements. They said, look, we've signed the treaty. We've taken on obligations. We have certain rights. And certain of those rights means that we have access to technology through the IAEA and elsewhere. Uh, so first you say no reactors. Then you say, OK, reactors, yes, but no enrichment. Now basically you're saying maybe, maybe some enrichment. Uh, of course, Western policy has, has fed the Iranian co government's capacity to m manipulate its population and its paranoia about, about it. You know, all Iranians would want to have access to first-line technology. They believe that they're an, an ancient country with a, the right to a certain amount of status and respect, uh, though I think that uh, many friendly Western commentators often forget that to remind the Iranian government that if they want the respect due to an ancient civilization, maybe they ought to treat their own population with a, with a certain amount of respect as well. And I think the Chinese play the same game all the time as well. So, I, I, you know, on that, um, on your question, of course, that's what I think is, is really what's important. I mean, if the implication of what I said is correct, basically the, the horse has bolted the barn, the question is how to minimize the consequences for the NPT and the region. That's, that's the key issue. And one is don't overstate the importance of Iran and what it can do with an embryo. I didn't say nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons announced. I said a nuclear weapons capability on the threshold. Don't exaggerate what it means. Uh, try and buttress other people's uh, security. Try continuously to get the Iranians to move back from it. Uh, and, uh, and as I say, to negate it. But I think that is the issue. And as you say, uh, Turkey and, uh, and Egypt particularly uh, would be uh, in a position to, to react. And uh, Egypt, because of its frustrated ex-leadership role in the region, it's no longer a leadership role, but it used to be. Uh, um, Turkey, because uh, of its uh, new nationalism and its new desire to play a role as, an, as a medium power. Saudi Arabia, I think, too, but Saudi Arabia has a long way to go. It doesn't have any nuclear capability. People say Pakistan might give it to them, but that's a bit of a long shot, given the fact that if it does that, it would then be faced with uh, a two nuclear... I mean, Iran would not be very happy if, if Pakistan gave nuclear weapons to Saudi, and then Pakistan would have two nuclear weapons on its... two nuclear weapon states on its borders. And, and since most of Pakistan's energy is focused on India, I don't think they're going to accommodate Saudi Arabia because that will complicate their life in the Gulf. So, but it is a problem, and it, it's a long-term problem. I mean, it won't happen in five years, but the other major powers will draw their conclusions about the NPT, draw their conclusions about the Security Council, and draw their conclusions about their need for security or status.
sorry, on Pakistan, why don't we speak uh, more about Pakistan and less about Iran? Uh, well, they, they, they are, it's because it's two different, completely different issues. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is a lot, many publication about uh, the risk of Pakistan nuclear weapons falling into the wrong hands and clearly it's a very insecure region uh, today. Uh, but Pakistan is not uh, a member of the NPT and, um, and then f therefore it is not, it's not an IEA uh, safeguard topic, it's a security issue and, and so it's dealt uh, separately and it's not part of the uh, NPT review conference either. It's not on the agenda, but uh, Mark will say more about it. But it's a real, it's a real problem. It's a real threat. Um, then Fabrice has provoked me about a nuclear test-free zone in the Middle East. <laughs> um, well, you know that uh, since 19, well, initially in 74, Iran and Egypt uh, took the initiative of promoting a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. And since 1980, every year, the UN General Assembly has agreed by consensus, including Israel, on the target of a nuclear weapons free zone, which became a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. Um, Egypt has been using uh, the, the fact that there is no progress for 30 years on this issue to say that uh, they refuse to, uh, to, to consider any measure to strengthen the non-proliferation treaty and in particular signing and ratifying the additional protocol, which is crucial uh, for the IA to be able to give the necessary guarantees. Um, and I think that um, for the EU in particular, since we are in Brussels, uh, but many other states uh, to insist that, yeah, this is a priority, a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East is a priority, we, we, we should insist on that. I think this is counterproductive. Uh, it is counterproductive because it's giving false ho hopes. Uh, we can discuss uh, a nuclear weapons free zone in, in the Middle East, which means only one thing. It means Israel joining the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. This is what it means, nothing else. So there is one loser and all the others are winners. Um, and this will take place uh, in a different uh, environment and when we speak about reaching a world without nuclear weapons, when you reach the, the 200 uh, weapons level in all nuclear weapon states, then you start looking at this issue seriously. But it is necessary to show that you can make progress concrete progress, not only talking about reaching that far away objective. And this is why I think it would be interesting to consider whether it makes sense to promote the initiative of a nuclear test free zone in the Middle East, which essentially means all the countries <coughs> in the region ratifying the CTBT. Uh, and, um, the funny thing is that well, all the countries should, should, be, should win. Uh, Egypt would be reassured that Israel does not go further, doesn't go beyond the red line of testing nuclear weapons. Um, for Israel, it would also give an assurance that, that Iran is not going beyond that. Uh, so uh, Egypt, Israel, and Iran objectively would, be, would have a, a benefit from, from such a, a nuclear weapons, a nuclear test free zone. However, for, for different reasons, none of them is going to suggest that. Uh, Egypt, because they reject anything which is less than a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. They have been advocating this for so long, uh, 36 years, that they are not going to consider anything less than that. Um, Israel will probably not consider it favorably. Uh, because they will consider that it's a distraction from the real issue, which is the Iranian nuclear program. And Iran will not engage in such a nuclear test-free zone because they cannot even talk to Israel, which they don't recognize. 
So you, you are in this strange situation that something which is in everyone's interest would not be proposed by those who would benefit most. So the question is, shouldn't other states, the EU in particular, and Turkey, which wants to play a role of mediator in the region, uh, take the initiative and say, let's try as a first step to a nuclear weapons free zone or weapons of mass destruction, start with a nuclear test free zone, which is really uh, uh, adhering to the, to the CTBT. So th th that's, that's the answer to this uh, very uh, difficult question. Thank you. Mark, you want to add? To get to your question, Pakistan and the summit vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. Iran was not a player at that meeting. Um, so they didn't figure. Pakistan was a player. And as Pierre uh, suggested, the issue in Pakistan at the summit as well as outside the summit is the situation regarding Pakistan's strategic nuclear assets. And it, during the, the run-up to the summit, there was a great deal of concern about how the Obama administration was going to play this, simply because in recent months, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about whether there would be a U.S. role for somehow increasing the security of those assets in Pakistan under the uh, latest, last developments of six months or so that is, is engendered in Pakistan an almost existential angst that the U.S. would somehow go into Pakistan and take its nuclear weapons away and the Pakistanis have become allergic to any discussion about the security of their nuclear assets, um, which led, I think, the summiteers on the Western side, particularly those who are engaged in discussions with Pakistan, uh, with uh, China, with uh, India, Afghanistan, and Russia about addressing security issues in South Asia, this group of states was rather reluctant to push that issue to the brink at the Nuclear Security Summit, in part because um, these issues are under uh, discussion already and they're subject to a very delicate security dialogue that's going on between the U.S. and Pakistan right now. So uh, there was a reason to keep it off the agenda. I'm uh, given to understand that in the closed-door meetings that took place during the summit, uh, Pakistan, uh, supported uh, incidentally by India, uh, expressed concern about the prospect that nuclear security uh, issues would somehow inhibit their nuclear weapons security by getting, you know, moving into the area of their strategic uh, uh, area to, to, to behave by themselves and, and to, and to uh, act autonomously in their nuclear uh, weapons um, deployment. So the Pakistanis were objecting to certain areas here during the summer meeting and they made very clear they, they did not share the entire agenda of the meeting. Well, thanks. I said we've got time for round two. So over there, please, sir. I am uh, Louis-Victor Brille from uh, the European Commission. I'd like to have your reaction on three questions. Sorry, for three questions. First, it's <clears throat> let's make a few parallels um, between Iran case and other case. Uh, first, I will say about the pride. I have heard uh, the pride word. Uh, I remember that in the 70s, uh, in some of the uh, nuclear weapon states, it was a real pride to have them, let's say France, for example, let's say the race between US and Russia was based, uh, not mainly, but partially at least, on the, the feeling of pride in, in, pride in, their, uh, in their population. So I, I would be very happy to, to have some of your reaction on that. Uh, secondly, about Russia. If Russia today would not have nuclear weapons, and would not have a seat in um, Security Council, what it would be on the strategic importance uh, of, of Russia, let's think, I would say, on negative uh, side here, means this can be an input for understanding what Iran may want to achieve 
by uh, having uh, or trying to, to, to acquire uh, capacity to make a nuclear weapon. The third, not the third question, third part of the first question is, uh, let's examine those countries which have um, uh, abandoned the um, acquisition of nuclear weapons. Well, South Africa is well known, but there are other ones, and Brazil and Argentina have ceased their, their race toward that. However, for example, Brazil is very um, cautious to, to have those uh, let's say, proof that they are able to master um, nuclear deterrence, uh, not speaking about enrichment, but speaking about their ability to launch satellites or to have a nuclear uh, submarine. So this is my, my first question. Let's compare with other countries along these... Uh, so just the, your question is absolutely brilliant, but if every one of your questions is broken down into three sub-questions, no, no, no. we're not going to have much time. So Sorry, it's a you will forgive me, and I'm certainly not being rude, but if you could present your other two questions uh, as simple questions, then, that would be good, and then we'll have no. other people asking as well. They are very rapid. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, Pakistan does not uh, belong to NPT does not make him uh, less dangerous than Iran. Uh, in absolute way. Here I have some, I'd like you to, to elaborate a little bit on that. And my last question is that uh, for, we cannot regularize those who have acquired a weapon outside of the NPT, of course, for the time being. Um, do, what do you think about the possibility to regularize with all the quotes necessary um, inside the development of a new FMCT who is uh, taking uh, place now. Thank you. Three very brief questions uh, on Iran internal politics. With no sub-clauses? Mm -hmm. None at all, or one question with three sub-clauses, if you allow. First of all, let's imagine that Mousavi had, was allowed, let's say, to win the elections last June. How would this affect the nuclear program? The second, which is related, is to what extent does Ahmadinejad has any control on the nuclear program, and how seriously we should take his um, statements, let's put it like that. And finally, is brain drain an issue delaying the nuclear program right now? Okay, Alex, thanks very much for three succinct questions. Uh, 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 looking at the what o'clock, we're obviously not going to have time for a third round, uh, and therefore, as this will be the final chance, does anybody else want to ask a one single question? Please, go ahead. Thank you. That's an extremely good question. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to write your speaking notes, draft speaking notes for you this evening. Uh, Fabris, what did you want to say? Something brief? Uh, yes. Go on. Um, I think we need the microphone. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to ask particularly Mark about the non aligned countries uh, and, and whether their current position uh, on all those issues are driven by real. Um, concerns about the, the NPT or whether they're also driven by high politics and a certain breed of new anti-Americanism or anti-Westernism, uh, which we start uh, seeing emerging both in Asia and, and also in Latin America. Thank you. Okay. And I apologize for this, but I also cannot resist just one question, which is on Iran, we have obviously the United States, which historically wants to limit the number of nuclear powers in the world. Uh, because nuclear, the nuclear club is a prestigious club and therefore the more people that join it, the less prestigious it becomes. Secondly, of course, because proliferation could lead to a much more dangerous uh, world. Uh, but what about the attitude of Russia and China, particularly as it comes out of the Iranian dossier? Are they less concerned about proliferation? Do they see it as less of a threat to their security? Are they more egalitarian at thinking that it's good that uh, everybody should have the, uh, the, the bomb um, or that you know, the consequences would not be as grave as the U.S. believes? Or, or, or is it really a question that uh, somebody implied that they're sort of playing this game because it's a good way of sticking it to the United States? But as it gets to the end game and they see that Iran is really getting close to acquiring a nuclear weapon, they suddenly think, well, you know, it's fun to poke the United States, but at the end of the day, is it really in our interest uh, to have a nuclear-armed Iran? And therefore, they'll rally, if you like, to a, 
uh, a more a more a more hard line sanctions etc uh, even if it's at the 11th hour that's that's the question sorry but i couldn't resist forgive me anyway we've got 15 minutes for this schmozka board of a uh, final questions but we'll reverse the order mark would you like to go first this time okay it is dr historically driven by real concerns about the future of the npt there's no question about it Th these concerns go back many many decades but we have in fact seen a polarization of this issue in recent years. It's been pointed out to me that the NAM, which has been active in Geneva and active in New York for many years, only very recently established a chapter in Vienna. Um, this happened uh, at the end of a long, uh, very negative relationship in many respects uh, between the United States under the Bush administration and the IA led by Mohamed Abarde. Um, I don't have to reiterate the uh, milestones of that relationship, but it would be fair to say, in fact, uh, that high politics are extremely important here in this. Um, as I said before, at the working group level, there's a lot of interaction between uh, Western states and NAM states to address technical issues, but at the high level of politics, the decision makers don't get it. They don't have any of that information. They're driven by a rhetoric which is somewhat self-reinforcing. Um, we've heard um, Sharon was saying that, in fact, that one of the issues that may be contributing to this is the fact that Egypt in recent years has been losing power in the region, and when that happens, then it's possible that the Egyptians may be relying on this rhetoric to maintain their status quo position vis-a-vis -vis other states in the, in the Arab world. Um, but there's no question that we've seen a deterioration of relations between the West the EU, the United States on the one side, and, and many of these actors on the other side. We're seeing that in Turkey. Um, Turkey is a country which has a, a nuclear uh, energy uh, ambition. Um, it's not clear, however, where that program is going to develop. Um, at the same time that Turkey has tried to start a nuclear power program, it has taken some decisions uh, affecting high nuclear politics, which uh, have displeased the P5. Turkey has not been cooperating uh, with the P5 on the issue of Iran and sanctions. Um, this is the case of Turkey is just emblematic here in this regard. Um, but I think it can be said that a great deal of damage was done to the climate in the Board of Governors and, the, and at the NPT. Uh, review conferences and prep conferences in general by the uh, confrontation between the Bush administration and the IEA secretariat. Uh, there's no question that the NAM perceived Bush as moving in a unilateral direction, ignoring their concerns. He was no longer perceived as, the U.S. was no longer perceived as being committed to the three pillars of the NPT. The, the, the interest in disarmament was eroding. Um, after the 9-11 episode, President Bush launched an initiative to, uh, in fact, try to dissuade uh, non-nuclear weapon states in the NPT from obtaining technologies for uranium enrichment and reprocessing. This was a very, very good idea, which unfortunately in translation in the Bush, Bush administration was portrayed as a matter of, of uh, preventing countries from developing their technological wherewithal. Um, that became magnified by the NAM in the debate, and we had uh, to to deal with this for a long period of time during the whole Bush era, uh, and it's played out right until the end, until 2009, when proposals that were put on the table by the IEA, which were in fact very beneficial to the NAM states, to set up um, a fuel bank 
uh, and a system of uh, guarantees to make sure that if supply of nuclear fuel would be cut off to them, that they would have access to nuclear fuel regardless of political uh, uh, actions taken by uh, their adversaries. Uh, these were all very good actions, but because the climate during the Bush era was so poisoned, um, right to the end, uh, into late 19, and 2009, the, the NAM states uh, failed to approve um, this, uh, this uh, proposal, and, and the IEA to this, to this day is, is dealing with the legacy of the poisoned relationship between the U.S. government and the IEA during that period. Well, thanks, sir. Yes. But the fewer um, you answer, the more Sharan has to answer. So sure. Remember your yeah. colleague. Well, I'm, although Sharan is certainly going to, to, to deal with the, the question about Musavi and Ahmadinejad, I, uh, I would just state what I think. Uh, I think um, if Musavi uh, had won the election, it would have changed nothing uh, from the nuclear weapons program. On the contrary, um, I think the I think Europe would have thought that uh, it's much easier and better. We can deal with them and give more time to diplomacy. Uh, but I think uh, he would have been unable to, even if he wanted to, to make any concession. Uh, it would have been uh, politically suicide. And uh, so I think uh, we, we, we would have thought that it's better, but it wouldn't have been. And what's the role of Ahmadinejad? Well, <clears throat> I think, uh, of course, Ahmadinejad cannot uh, decide on the nuclear policy alone, clearly not. Uh, he, he can express the view in different ways, and I think, uh, the way he have done, uh, expressed the, the opinion on, on, on the nuclear program, uh, on denying the Holocaust, on uh, aggressing Israel, has been, in fact, very counterproductive. And uh, so I think, uh, yes, Musevian would have done that much better. And uh, the program might be even further advanced than it is today. But I, I'm, I'm curious to see what the other speaker will say. Uh, Ashton, it's too late to ask the question. <laughs> you have to do that earlier. She's leaving after tomorrow. Um, the FMCT for Pakistan, yeah. Well, you know, the, the problem with the FMCT and Pakistan blocking, in fact, any progress on the FMCT is partially, at least, a reaction to the U.S.-India deal. Um, which clearly favors India and the Pakistan say, as long as you don't, if the F as long as the FMCT doesn't deal also with the uh, fissile stockpile, uh, we are not going to to agree on anything. Uh, and we know that this is a non-starter because if you want to progress stepwise, you need an FMCT saying we we stop new production of uh, weapons material and, and leave for later the question of reducing the stockpiles, which is a much more difficult one. So by, by understanding, we, we can all understand Pakistan position, but this is a consequence of the, of the Indian exception uh, that was even agreed by the NSG, uh, which, which is a terrible thing. Um, Jamie, I mean, your question is extremely difficult. Uh, are Russia and China less concerned than the U.S. about non-proliferation and more nuclear weapon states? <sighs> um, it, it, it's a difficult one. Uh, it, Frame of I, if I had to say yes or no, I would say uh, yes. Uh, they are less, less concerned. Uh, and they see uh, short and medium term advantage in, in playing it the way they are doing. Uh, the only good thing about 
Iran is that the interests of Russia and China are opposite. Uh, Russia would love Israel to bomb Iran because that for sure uh, first would push the, the barrel of oil above $200 a barrel, which is the thing China fears most. So there they have opposite interests. And Russia uh, be, would, would be called to play a role, a mediator role in the Middle East, which they also would love to. So from a cynical point of view, uh, I don't think Russia in the short term uh, wish to see any, uh, any solution there. China, it's not true. China, in the case of Iran, they, they, on the contrary, they don't want sanctions because they don't want to uh, undermine their uh, oil supply from, and gas supply from Iran. And so it's a question of money. And the EU is very cautious because also they have economic interest in, in Iran. And so that's why we say it. But uh, in, in North Korea, we've seen the failure of China and uh, again, uh, they fear less uh, having North Korea having nuclear weapons and the regime uh, remaining in place than having uh, the regime fall and a unified Korea uh, peninsula, uh, which would be under the South Korean umbrella and U.S. umbrella. And uh, uh, as long as the U.S. is supporting Taiwan, um, they are going to support North Korea whether or not they have nuclear weapons. So. It's very, it's very complicated. Thank you. Well, you know, the, they don't value non-proliferation as much as they value bilateral relations. And that was also true of the United States when it turned a blind eye to Pakistan when Afghan, Afghanistan was invaded. Um, so having said that, I think that uh, China must be concerned about proliferation in Japan. Uh, it's not completely oblivious to it, to proliferation, but in the short term, I think they're much more interested in the bilateral relationship and the, and the tying, tying down of the U.S. Uh, I don't think there's a grand strategy of multipolarity, promoting multipolarity in, in that sense. I think it's much more short term. Um, on other precedents and uh, status and so on, you know, surprised you you want to sort of justify what some people have or are doing to sort of justify other what other people do I mean that Brazil might think it it'll get status from having a nuclear capability perhaps it does uh, all I know is that there are at least three countries Israel France and Britain who must wonder what on earth they have nuclear weapons for Israel, in a sense, has, has provided the alibi for the Iranians to go down that road. Iran, uh, Israel is conventionally strong. When it went down this road, it wasn't. It was really in danger. It, was, it felt in danger of being thrown into the sea by 100 million Arabs. Uh, subsequently, we found out that they, Israel could defeat the Arabs with the help of American arms uh, conventionally, but it has no answer to the various intifadas and insurgencies that take place. The nuclear weapons are virtually useless in any contingency you can think of except other nuclear weapons, which they've provoked, in a sense, or they've justified. I England and France, they've been looking around for a rationale for nuclear weapons since the end of the Cold War. Uh, Britain, even today, uh, Clegg and, and others argue, argue that we're not spending money on the regular forces, which will be used. And what, what do we need a trident? Do we need three tridents? How much will we spend on the nuclear program? What's it for? Who's it against? And so on and so forth. So I really don't think that it's very hard once you get there to give it up. There's a sunk cost, there are institutions, there are bureaucracies and so on. But I, I don't see the argument that because some countries have gone down the road and come back, uh, uh, or, or that France and Britain, and Britain had the top table argument, as you remember. The argument for nuclear weapons was that Britain wanted to sit at the top table. Uh, France's argument was after Suez, having been ditched by the Americans. They, they didn't want a repeat of Suez. They wanted to go down that road. And you may recall France was the pri primary provider of Israel. But I, I don't see that, let's say, erroneous policies. If you think, as I do, that a world without nuclear weapons is desirable, it may not be easily achievable, but it's desirable, then I don't think opening the door to new entrants is a good idea. 
And I don't think that drawing parallels between what other people did before, which were mistaken, to justify what other people should do now is very helpful. All right? Intellectually helpful or practically helpful. I'm not going to get into the discussion of what difference it would make if you had the so-called moderates or the greens in Iran as opposed to the current group. I think it would make a lot of difference. It would make a lot of difference. Uh, again, it's a question of how you formulate it. Are you asking the Iranians to, to stop their program? They won't stop their program. Are you asking them to become your servants because they're democratic, um, quasi-democratic? They're not going to. They're going to be very difficult customers, whoever runs the country. But you would have more assurance of a responsible, transparent uh, system in, in the critics of the regime that you hear, whether it's particularly Karoubi, but Mousavi and, and, uh, and Khatami, than you do under the current system. And it's, that's what it's all about. It's not about technology. If it was about technology, we'd be raking uh, Japan over the coals. It's about trust, transparency, reassurance. We have no assurance what the Iranians are going to do, what they say, based on the record of their behavior and their actions. If they change that behavior and actions, one could imagine that certain technologies which we don't want them to have now would be permissible. I've always believed that this is, I'm not a fanatic arms controller. This is an issue of politics. It's an issue of trust and transparency and behavior. If Iran was a status quo power, taking responsible positions in the region rather than trying to kick the West out and uh, benefit from f conflicts. If it were, uh, I won't say on the West side, I'd say an independent state of a certain responsible uh, policy, one would have far less worries about enrichment, how close they are, how far they are. It, this is what it's about. So yes, politics make a lot of difference and uh, the people who want an accountable government and an honest government in the sense, I don't mean of financial corruption, but I mean honest representation. But did yeah. that happen without the change of the Supreme Leader? No. And, and, that, and we didn't okay. get into the discussion. Lots of things can, can happen that would prove my theory wrong. And one of them, apart from oil price slides, uh, the, the, I'm sorry I haven't answered your question about defections or brain drain. There, there are things that could slow the program down, that might slow the program down, that might change the cost calculus. But in my view, a change in the succession, uh, the change in the Supreme Leader, the Supreme Leader leaving, dying, uh, will create a real impetus for the Iranians to make a decision. They're very bad at making decisions. And one of the decisions might be on this as well. Uh, Sharam, uh, uh, Pierre, uh, Mark, uh, I think on behalf of everybody, thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Fabrice and Fabrice, your colleagues, your team at Carnegie, uh, for organizing tonight's event, producing three extremely uh, interesting speakers. Uh, that's not said with protocol in mind. That comes from the heart, as well as from the head, even more from the head than from the heart. Um, I'd also, of course, like to thank everybody for coming this evening. Uh, I said at the beginning you had to sacrifice one and a half hours of the most rare and precious commodity in Brussels, sunshine. But uh, I think you'll all agree with me that uh, it was worth it. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I'm sure you've learned a lot uh, as well. Thanks again uh, for giving us your time. And uh, could we have a round of applause for the three speakers? Class dismissed.